So this week, your lab covers the processes of diffusion and osmosis. And if you've looked at your textbook and you've looked in your lab manual, you've noticed the definitions that diffusion is the movement of molecules from high concentration of that molecule away three-dimensionally in all directions until it's evenly spread throughout the given area. And you've experienced this when you've smelled perfume from across the room. Those molecules are diffusing from the person on which the perfume is uh, laid and gradually moving out from that source point to throughout the room. So I think you've probably seen this phenomenon in a lot of different ways in your everyday life, but let's set up a demonstration for checking at the end of this video. So here I have a beaker of water, and in addition to that, I have just some regular food coloring like you might buy in the supermarket. And what I'm going to do is go ahead and drop in one, two, three, four, five drops of dye. And let me give you a zoom in on that and then we'll wait and see what happens by the end of our video. So what you should see is that there are swirls of dye spreading down into the water from those original point sources. Now what we expect is that the dye is going to move away in all directions until it's uniformly distributed throughout the beaker. At the same time, water, which was more heavily concentrated in the beaker, is going to be spreading all directions into the dye. And we'll check our beaker again at the end of our video. So when preparing for lab, it's a good idea not only to look through the lab manual and see what you're doing for diffusion and osmosis. Here I see some bold-faced terms. Exercise 1, diffusion of molecules. You're going to do molecule diffusion through a semi-permeable membrane using dialysis tubing. And then osmotic activity in cells, you're actually going to see the osmotic behavior of cells with a plant cell wall. So that'll be experiment B under osmotic behavior in cells. So there's quite a bit to do. And the more prepared you are, the better use of your time in lab. So probably one of the first things you want to do is learn the bold-faced terms. Make sure that you're familiar with your vocabulary before you go into lab so that you can talk about the experiment in the term scientists use. And so I'm going to go to my textbook. I'm going to open back to this glossary index section. So here I am in the index that's orange-coated. The glossary is in green. So I could use the glossary to look up osmosis, look up diffusion, or I can go back to the orange section and look for diffusion here. And in fact, I find that diffusion is on page 131, but then there are some follow-up pages too. Like I might want to look at diffusion in plant cells on page 207, or diffusion of water across plant plasma membranes on page 782. So all of these would be good follow-up, but I'm going to start with page 131. So I go back in my textbook to page 131, and what do I find? Wow, I find some images that show diffusion of more than one molecule across a membrane. And as I continue to read, I can learn about diffusion and I can learn about osmosis itself. And then on the next page, 132, I see some situations in animals and plant cells which, in which these cells either will swell and burst or simply swell and be healthy or shrink depending on what kind of environment they're placed in and how salty or full of solute their internal space is in the cytoplasm. And so these pictures look like they're going to be really helpful in me understanding today's lab even though they're not featured in the lab manual. So I understand terms. Now I'm going to go through and see what kinds of activities I'm doing. And I notice that some are simple and have just to do with the movement of molecules but the complex one is this one I need to set up that is going to involve dialysis tubing. What is dialysis tubing and why are we using it for this experiment? In lab you'll be using kidney dialysis tubing in order to investigate what osmosis is like when molecules can move across a membrane. But we never really talk a lot about where this dialysis tubing comes from. You may have known somebody who had to have dialysis due to low kidney function. And the way that this works, since the kidneys are responsible for removing impurities from the blood, is that a patient goes into the dialysis clinic, and you can see here that blood is removed from the patient's arm, it goes into the dialysis machine, and within the dialysis machine, there's a membrane 
that's made of the same kind of semi-permeable tubing you'll be using in lab. Some molecules, like the waste molecules, are able to pass through. And those molecules then are collected into a collection waste container. However, the blood now is relatively clean. The impurities have been removed, the ammonia waste products that are from cellular respiration, and those products will be taken back and returned to the blood of the patient. And so by this mechanical process, but by using osmosis across a semi-permeable membrane, we can remove impurities from the blood and return that clean blood to the patient to make up for the deficiency in the function of their kidneys. So in addition to doing the experiment with dialysis tubing, you're going to be looking at osmotic activity in cells themselves. So you have a potato cells experiment that you're going to do. You're also going to observe, well, not directly but indirectly observe osmosis out of a, an Elodea or a Nacris plant cell. So you'll have an aquatic plant and you're going to place salt solution on it and what you'll observe is the results of water having left that cell. So if water leaves the inside of a plant cell, the cell inside shrivels up. There's no more water inside that cell. And you're going to observe that right under your microscope. So hopefully you're getting to be reasonably good with your microscope. You're going to be looking at some cells in lab this week and watching how they change as their environment changes. Part of this week's lab on osmosis and diffusion is going to involve a seed germination setup where you're going to set up some common radish seeds, not carbon garden bean seeds like shown in the picture here, but radish seeds. And those radish seeds you're going to expose to different concentrations of salt solution and you're gonna see how well they're able to germinate given those environmental conditions. So how is it that salt solution relates to seed germination? Well, the very first step in the germination of a seed is for the seed itself to imbibe. That means to drink, doesn't it? So the seed in the soil, or in your case in Petri dishes, must absorb water because it's protected by a hard seed coat. But when the seed imbibes that water, it's going to split the seed coat and that allows that initial root and initial shoot to break through and begin the growth. It also allows the enzymes within the seed itself to activate so that they can begin breaking down the stored food source that's contained within that seed so that that embryonic plant can begin to make its first growth before it's out in the sun and able to photosynthesize. So with radishy seeds, you'll test their ability to germinate in salt solution. How does that water get into the seed? Wouldn't that be osmosis? The movement of water across the membrane? Well, doesn't it seem like the environmental conditions might influence how well osmosis into the seed proceeds? So think about osmosis, think about the membrane in the cell of each and every cell within that little seed as you're setting up your experiment and making your hypothesis. Now I think it's probably time to take a look at our diffusion beaker. So let's get another close-up of that. So it's hard to believe that you are looking just directly at the beaker here. You can still see some swirls of color here and there, but you'll notice that for the most part, it's a lot more evenly distributed, that dye, than it was when we started the video. So as you can see, without any active stirring, those molecules have spread through the beaker. They're not perfectly uniform yet, but if we were to leave them for a day or a week or a month, then certainly the water molecules and the dye molecules would be, each of them, uniformly distributed in that beaker without any internal input of energy. Have fun in lab.